Grand Portage Resources recently completed the 2018 drill program on its 100% controlled Herbert Gold Discovery property located in the prolific Juneau Belt in southeast Alaska. Drill results are expected through late 2018. Past drill results included numerous multi-ounce gold assays on multiple veins. Grand Portage trading symbols are GPG on the TSX Venture, GPTRF on the OTCQB, and GPB on Frankfurt. For more information, please visit our website, grandportage.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ted Dixon, CEO and co-founder of InkResearch.ca. He invented the Inc. Canadian Insider Index, which is used by the Horizons Canadian Insider Index ETF, a 2017 and 2018 Fun Data Fun Grade A Plus award winner. His website, CanadianInsider.com. Welcome back to the show, Ted. Well, thanks for having me back, Jim. Ted, the market's today rather tepid, uh, slightly up, slightly down. What is happening? Are we in kind of a holding pattern? Well, that's what we wrote about in our weekly newsletter, Insights holding pattern, what's next, insiders are behaving as if momentum is stalling here out of the market. And what I mean by that is uh, when you have a nice run-up in stocks, uh, usually insiders start to take profits because they see some stocks getting ahead of themselves. They, you know, they Insiders may have bought at much lower prices or taking profits. That's usually a healthy sign, you know, depending on what stage you are in that uh, momentum-driven rally in the stock market. You know, After a, a prolonged period, it gets overdone. But in the uh, early stages, such as you know what we've had off the bottom after, after the Christmas uh, Eve low, we would expect to see some insider profit-taking. Now it's uh, stalled out here, which suggests to me that uh, the overall market is starting to stall out. It's losing some momentum. So you've got, uh, on the one hand, you've got a lot of stocks that, that were kind of charging higher, losing momentum, and on the other hand, you've got insiders who were at a, taking a healthy level of profits have now pulled back on that. So we're really in kind of a holding pattern to see what's next, Jim. Are we get, are we in for a correction uh, back, you know, maybe perhaps even to test those uh, December 24th lows, or are we just consolidating here, uh, hoping to move higher on uh, our Canadian Insider Index? Uh, we're looking uh, at a technical level of 1,160 as sort of key resistance. You know, it, it made a run at it again uh, earlier this week, and today it's it's pulled back. And over in the United States, we're seeing a similar situation with, uh, you know, looking at 2,800 being a key level. Now that the broad index has breached that, they, they went above that on Tuesday. We'll see if that's sustainable. We're seeing a similar pattern in the U.S., and the uh, I think the risks in the, the the stakes in the U.S. market are even higher than they are in Canada because uh, uh, just of you know how how big the rally's been off of a very strong long bull market in the United States. Uh, it's it, it really I think is going to require a big gust of momentum, a big gust a gust of speculation to push stocks to new highs in the United States. And if we get into that scenario, then, you know, we could be looking at quite an interesting fall again if, uh, you know, we get a run-up in speculation here in the next few weeks and next few months. You know, it's getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but let's just say at the, uh, at this point, uh, we're at a holding pattern in terms of what insiders are signaling on both sides uh, of the border, north and, you know, the north side and the south side. And, you know, it could break either way. Uh, at this point, uh, you know, I think you have to uh, approach the market with some caution uh, because the risk to the downside are there. And if you move to the upside, it's likely going to be a, a speculative-driven type of activity that takes us there. Are we on the cusp of a recession or are things still positive enough that we're not? Well, we wrote about that in terms of the U.S. briefly in our in a blog post on uh, KeneanInsider.com, uh, entitled uh, North American Insiders Signal That 
stocks face heavy resistance. We're not we're not uh, calling for a recession based on what we see insiders doing, but we're concerned about the industrial sector in the United States in particular. You know, and uh, I believe that's uh, home to uh, Boeing, of course, which has uh, got its own particular problems. But in general, we see very depressed levels of insider activity in the industrial sector. That's not a healthy sign. We've, we see it at really at, at really strong warning levels. You know, if you believe that stocks are going to move higher from here, significantly higher from here, it's unlikely that the industrials are going to be part of that. So you're really building a different type of picture for the U.S. market in terms of what would be driving it higher. Uh, you know, will it be the fang, uh, comeback of the FANG stocks uh, to lead things higher? I don't think so. Uh, will it be just a broad-based ETF-driven rally with um, – Funds moving into broad ETFs, putting everybody up, pulling every, all, you know, you know, lifting all the boats. You know, we would have to see. But at this point, we're seeing some uh, some very uh, uh, very cautious signals coming out of our insider sentiment indicators in the industrials area, and that has us uh, a bit concerned. How are the transports doing? Well, we don't we don't track the, the transports uh, per se, like the, in terms of Dow theory. We look at uh, the top level sectors, and and they are they are a uh, uh, a sub a subgroup of the industrials, uh, and they really haven't you know in terms of what we've been looking at, they've been behaving that much differently than the overall industrial sectors. So in general. Uh, that whole industrials area, as I said, is is one that that we're a bit concerned about, and I, uh, you know, I think you can put transports in there generally as well. Certainly in Canada, you know, uh, the two big railways that we see that we track, of course, CN and CP, uh, we don't have uh, very optimistic uh, signals at the at the stock level. On uh, certainly on uh, CN, we've been seeing some uh, some insider uh, profit taking. And uh, in CP earlier in the year, we also saw some uh, some very, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, concerning signals in terms of combinations of insider selling and share buybacks. We don't like to see both of those taking uh, place at the same time, where you've got insiders that are selling at the companies buying back shares. We saw some of that at CP or uh, over the last. Uh, uh, Few months, anyways. It may have been uh, may have been er, er, late 2018, but uh, we're we we don't see either of those uh, two major railway uh, names as being particularly attractive in terms of opportunity in the Canadian market right now. Uh, what about all the extra tanker cars for oil that are being purchased? Would that boost their prospects, or does that take too long to go online right now? Well, Jen, anytime you get government involved, <laughs> I'm always skeptical that there's a happy outcome, unless, of course, uh, you know the terms are so favorable to the receiver of the government uh, uh, program that uh, it's a no situation. There are situations like that, uh, you know. I, but uh, we'll have to see how that program works. So I think it's it's way too early to. Uh, to jump to any kind of optimistic assessment that uh, this oil by rail proposal, I believe it's still a proposal, um, whether it would be positive, because uh, we ha- you one has to ask, uh, how does that impact the networks? How does that impact our other business? Uh, so, uh, you know, it could be a double-edged sword. Uh, you know, we'll have to see how that unfolds, uh, if the project uh, even uh, moves full steam ahead as envisioned. But uh, certainly oil by rail has been a, uh, a big help to those uh, railway companies. The, the question is, has all that good news been priced in? So it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that, that necessarily that either of those two railways are are, are you know going to be facing some sort of uh, even an earnings recession. Uh, it, it 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 reflects uh, likely uh, a lot of the good news that's already been priced into the stock. So there's you know that that's the first. Uh, concern I think any investor has to look at when they're looking at an investment is has all all the upside already been priced in and how much more upside has to be delivered in order for the stock to outperform the market, right? So 
uh, in, uh, in terms of the railways, so we think that uh, based off our signals anyways, that a lot of the good news out there has already been priced in. We'll have more with Ted Dixon right after this. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Magnum Gold Corp, MGI and the TSX Venture Exchange. A 2015 drill program on the LH property intersected several high-grade gold intersections, including 11 meters of 20.66 grams per ton gold. Additional drill targets on the LH property have been identified by a 2018 drone airborne magnetic survey to further evaluate a pyrotite enriched gold-bearing system. Please visit our website at magnumgoldcorp.com. MGX Minerals is revolutionizing the new energy economy with patented lithium extraction technology replacing traditional solar evaporation using low-cost, low-energy nanofiltration. The first system of this paradigm shift technology is currently being commissioned. MGX Minerals trades on the CSE, symbol XMG, the OTCQB, symbol MGXMF, and Frankfurt, symbol 1MG. For more information, visit our website, mgxminerals.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ted Dixon. Ted, uh, figures have come out. The uh, disposable income to debt ratio in Canada has hit 174%. Does that mean most of us are tapped out and can't really contribute much more to the consumer-driven economy? Well, I think that, you know it's been a big concern for now a number of years, and uh, we, we seem to be able to keep pushing the envelope. But uh, sure, I think that uh, you know certainly the uh, Retail sector, if you're investing in that, you have to be very uh, picky as to where you're going. And, and the financial sector as well, in terms of how much more growth is there that the, and margin growth that some of these financial institutions can uh, squeeze out. But I think you know, stock selection is really key. Uh, you know, one of the uh, uh, one of the names that uh, we follow that uh, quite closely. Is a uh, company called Go Easy. I'm not recommending this stock, but it's a consumer finance stock. So you would think that they're going to be in trouble if uh, you know, given you know the debt loads of Canadians, how much uh, how much more financing can they take on? But uh, you know, it depends on the profile of the customers of all these institutions. So for Go Easy, before you jump to a conclusion, that's kind of going to be, uh, you know, a relative uh, loser here, you have to look at the profile of their customer. Do they pay their debts in hard times compared to some of the other institutions? So the company has a certain, <laughs> come out with some certain claims on that front that they, that, that their customers are pretty good uh, when, uh, in the, in the, in tough times. So my point being is not, uh, is not uh, to highlight that stock per se, but in the Canadian retail sector, it's really going to be a stock picker's uh, uh, situation here where you're going to have some companies that, uh, uh, you know, are, are highly levered uh, and will be exposed where other companies may be able uh, to relatively dodge the bullets, but there's no guarantee, of course, if there is a big downturn, well, then everything's, you know, the whole sector is going to get, going to get hit. And then, you, you know, that's probably uh, once, once the, uh, once the chickens come home to roost, that's probably when the buying opportunities will uh, will take place in the market. Uh, you know, at this point in the cycle, though, uh, you know, the whole sort of Canadian retail uh, financial services sector, you're really, uh, I think, you're really looking at a stock by stock uh, uh, basis here, as opposed to uh, you know trying to uh, ride the last uh, last few innings or. Last few uh, chapters here of the uh, Great Canadian Debt Cycle, which, uh, which uh, at some point is going to have to take a pause. Bloomberg's reporting that the meeting between President Trump and Xi of China has been postponed at least until April. Does that tell us that U.S.-China trade talks either are going well or have stalled? I don't think it really uh, sheds much light on what's going to come out of this. I think our best uh, our best our, our best resource in terms of looking at what to expect is what happened with the uh, Canada Mexico U.S. Uh, NAFTA negotiations, where there was a lot of media interest. And at the end of the day, we basically got a nothing burger. You know, it was uh, it, it was uh, a, a lot of a lot of uh, Hype, a lot of uncertainty. Which, by the way, that uncertainty on a net basis 
probably benefited the United States. But uh, at the end of the day, the deal that was announced was no big deal. And I uh, would be surprised if there's going to be a big deal announced uh, between uh, the U.S. and China. There may be some kind of framework. There may be some kind of, you know, we'll buy more of this and, and you buy more of that. But to be honest with you, I just don't see, Jim, how there is going to be a substantive deal. I don't know why China would uh, agree to a deal that didn't address its concerns on the technology side, just as you, I don't see how the U.S. would uh, sign a deal that doesn't address its concerns on the technology side. And they're, they're, they're quite different. I mean, the U.S. is uh, w- rightly concerned about intellectual property protection. And the Chinese will say, well, how come uh, we're being blocked from, uh, you know, some of our companies, uh, Huawei, for example, being blocked from uh, infrastructure projects in the United States? So there's that's going to be a hard one to solve. So we'll see. They, they may kick that can down the road, uh, and we'll have to see the appetite for doing that on both sides. And we won't know that until uh, until there is a deal or announcement that there is no deal. And that, by the way, we may get, oh, you just can't do this, there is no deal. And uh, uh, that, that I don't think is something uh, markets have particularly factored in, that scenario, but it, it is possible. I don't think Trump wants that, but uh, you, you know he he made a big a big show of walking away from uh, the last North Korea round of talks. So um, you know markets have to brace for that uh, possible outcome as well. We'll have more with Ted Dixon right after the break. I'm Kelly Jennings, CEO of Powerband Solutions. Powerband is a cloud-based provider of auction inventory, and finance solutions that make buying, selling, and financing vehicles more efficient. Powerband Solutions trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol PBX and on the OTCQB symbol PWWBF and on Frankfurt symbol 1ZV. For more information, please visit us at PowerbandSolutions.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com Weekly Recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com Weekly Recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ted Dixon. Ted brings it, no matter, it seems, what kind of deal Theresa May suggests to her parliament, they'll reject it. And uh, apparently the European Union says, they're willing to continue talks to, to see if they can have a long discussion because the deadline for them to leave is just a few days away. Does it matter to us how well this uh, thing goes between Britain and the EU? Well, I'm I'm sure it matters in some companies that have uh, exposure to those two markets, and and I wouldn't want to uh, you know try and get into the the pluses and minuses uh, if there are any pluses of that uh, uh, unraveling. But in general, uh, I don't believe it's going to be a, a big deal. Uh, I mean, who knows? I mean, it, you know, the, the markets right now, uh, I think, are, are so um, fragile uh, in that holding pattern that it may not take much to shake it out of a holding pattern. So, look, maybe a no-Brexit situation uh, might be the the event that sends markets lower. Hey, it might be the event that sends markets higher. You know, the, you know the, the the fact that the the news is out of the way. But that's how fragile markets are right now. So it, it could be one of those events that just is more of an excuse to to move uh, that sends off some uh, algorithmic trading patterns in one direction and and off goes the market. But fundamentally. Uh, you know, I, 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 it's all been co- well covered in the financial media. Uh, the two outcomes are shouldn't be a, a huge surprise to anyone, except the fact that we will have to have a resolution to this at some point. And the question is, when is that point? How much further will it get kicked down the road, or do they just bite the bullet and do this Brexit and then and, and then kind of work backwards in terms of okay, now now where do we go from here? So. Uh, let's see what happens. I mean, I think that uh, I think that it, it could go either way in terms of how markets react. Uh, and don't forget, of course, it could ju- it could just be another treated as another nothing burger. And um, you know, 
the markets move on to other concerns. And, uh, you know, that would be, uh, I, I think, you know, the overriding factor here, monetary policy, you know, how, uh, how, uh, how is uh, the Fed's uh, behavior going to impact asset prices? Uh, they, the, uh, the the chairman of the Fed, Jerome Powell, now you know he's saying, "Well, we're almost at neutral. We're basically at neutral." You know, he's kind of trying to respin what he was saying uh, six months ago that you know they, that they were going to keep hiking till they got to neutral. Well, now he's saying, "Well, we're not hiking anymore. We're, we're kind of at neutral." Well, kind of at neutral is not neutral, and. He doesn't really know what neutral is anyway, so there's this whole sort of fog of, of what Fed policy really means for markets, and that is going to be worked out in price action, and that is going to be, I think, the underlying driver over the next few weeks. If stocks soar to new, high, soar to new highs, it'll be because the Fed has not tightened enough that they've let the, the asset bubble um, reinflate, and then th- that'll have consequences down the road, and probably not that far down the road. Now, maybe they've over tightened here and uh, the economy is already heading into recession as if we, we're not calling for that but boy when I look at uh, our industrial indicator it's certainly something to be concerned about so I think overall you know Brexit will come and go hopefully but uh, it's it's what's happened with all this central bank meddling uh, that's really going to be uh, the uh, either the tailwind or the headwind for the markets uh, unfortunately uh, it's not clear uh, what direct direction the wind's going to be blowing here uh, over the next few weeks. The federal budget is next Tuesday in Canada. What should the finance minister do to make sure that we don't go into recession, or can he do anything? <laughs> well, what the, what I think the, the finance minister uh, should do is, is completely irrelevant, Jim, because he would never do what I think he should do. But, uh, uh, look, you know, he... It, it's a few months before the election. This is going to be an election budget. It's probably going to be awful for the economy over the, the, the medium term. It'll probably be high on uh, giving a short-term boost uh, through gimmicks. And, uh, yeah, that might, it may or may not help uh, the Canadian economy. Uh, there's a lot of indicators, uh, and, you know, people who've been following uh, uh, your uh, uh, House Street broadcast, uh, which are available on CanadianInsider.com, by the way. Uh, you've had plenty of guests talk about the uh, impact of the real estate market, the mortgage market, signals it's sending not healthy for the Canadian economy. Will the uh, federal government try and loosen mortgage rules? Probably, or do something to make housing more expensive. You know, they're going to say it's more afford- to make it more affordable for ho- for some home buyers. But what what they really are doing when they do get gimmicks like that, they make it more expensive, then they make it better for those in the real estate industry and those, you know, in, around it, the financial services industry around it, uh, they, you know, they make it better for all of that gra- crowd, but they don't really make it better uh, in, in the very uh, medium, ter- medium term for new home buyers because home prices go back up. So, uh, you know, uh, anyway, we just have to get, we have to get, brace ourselves for this, uh, this ridiculous mantra that uh, by uh, inflating uh, uh, housing prices uh, through subsidies and uh, taxpayer back measures, by inflating housing prices, we're making housing more affordable. So uh, we'll have to get ready for for that spin, and uh, that's a bipartisan spin. Uh, I, you know, the uh, the conservatives uh, were big promoters of of uh, housing subsidy type financing uh, programs via CMHC when they're in power. Liberals have actually been quite uh, restrained and have actually undone some of that, uh, but uh, it's election year, so uh, I suspect uh, a lot of that discipline um, will uh, be uh, dispensed with. Are prices for homes going down just because that's the way the natural cycle goes? If they were so high, they had no choice but to come down. Well, at some point, uh, you know, uh, when you... if, if uh, you run out of uh, people willing to speculate. Uh, if you run out of, you know, people who have the salaries to pay high prices, uh, if you run out of money laundering dollars uh, uh, coming from, uh, you know, all four corners of the world, uh, yeah, you know, it, it just uh, it, the question is: Do prices go down, or do they uh, do they plateau for a number of years? And uh, in Vancouver, they seem to be coming down. 
Uh, in other uh, parts of the country, they didn't have the same type of speculation, money laundering, and the like. Um, you know, maybe uh, the situation will be a, a, uh, better, but uh, we'll have to see. And uh, that's, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, how investors want to play it, again, uh, you've got to be very uh, stock-specific. Uh, you know, in Canada, we, we're, you know, in terms of where the opportunity is, we, we see it primarily in uh, the resource area, uh, the oil patch, because uh, there's so much bad news already priced in. In, uh, and in the mining area, particularly uh, gold, gold stocks, uh, because uh, of just the global geo, you know, geopolitical uh, events that are taking place, uh, gold is going to be, I think, a, a great hedge, as particularly as we can, <laughs> particularly Jim, as we move into the next presidential election. Uh, because wow, uh, I think you're going to have to strap on your seatbelt for some pretty wild policy uh, scenarios coming out of the United States, and I expect just about all of them will be gold-friendly. Gold Ted, thank you so much for chatting with us. Well, thanks for having me back. My guest has been Ted Dixon, CEO and co-founder of IncResearch.ca, his website, CanadianInsider.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter, at HowStreet. Our YouTube channel, Talk Digital Network. If you have questions for Ted or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.